The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. My name is Joe McBeth, and I'm the Executive Director for the National Alliance for Direct Support Professionals. And welcome to today's webinar. This is the second webinar that we've done that takes a deeper look into the Frontline Initiative, our newsletter that we put out in association and partnership with the University of Minnesota's Research and Training Center. Um, we have been doing these frontline initiatives, believe it or not, since 1996. This is our 22nd year of doing these. And this is only our second one where we have the opportunity to uh, interview a couple of the authors. And this is a real special edition uh, where we are looking at the supported decision-making issue. And I'm real happy to make a special announcement where we welcome our friend and colleague Desiree Laux Bear, who was an author in this issue. But Desiree has also agreed to come on to the NADSP staff, and she will be starting on March 1st as the Assistant Executive Director, and she will be largely responsible for many of the day-to-day -day operations of the organization. So not only is she a, a very knowledgeable person in supported decision-making, but I'd like to welcome Desiree to the NADSP staff. So thank you and welcome, Desiree. Thank you, um, John, I'm going to turn this over to you. Um, this is going to be your opportunity to interview others. So um, I'd also like to welcome John Raphael, our Director of Educational Services. So John, without further ado, take it away. Uh, thank you, Joe, and uh, thank you, Desiree and, and Hezi, um, uh, for, for joining us. Uh, this is exciting. Uh, this is our second, as Joe said, this is our second uh, diving deeper into the Frontline Initiative webinar. Um, I'm really thrilled about this one because I think the topic supported decision making, essentially that's the, the, the larger topic of this webinar, um, uh, is important for direct support professionals to understand. And I think we're going to have a nice understanding uh, by the end of this hour uh, in, in the dialogue and discussion and conversation we're going to have with Desiree and Hezzy. Um, but before we get to, to Desiree and Hezzy, um, I do want to uh, take a moment and, and just dive a little bit into the um, learning objectives for um, this particular webinar. I think it's important for any kind of uh, uh, educational opportunity to have objectives. Uh, so by three o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time, <laughs> or within this hour, we hope that um, you listen to this discussion that's going to happen in and around supported decision making and understand what it is and what it is not uh, because it is something different than informed decision making. It's different than guardianship and I think Desiree and Hezzy will, will certainly clarify that. Um, I think once you get the definition of what it is, uh, what's involved in supported decision making as a process because that's what it is. It's a process. It's not a one-time event. It's not some kind of uh, immediate application that goes on in a person's life um, it, and you're going to learn about what it actually is, what the process is. Um, where do direct support professionals come in to play when it comes into helping in the supported decision making process? That's a very important thing that I think DSPs in the United States and, and North America and certainly Canada, um, you need to understand supported decision making because I think we're going to see more of it. Um, and I think uh, you're going to hear that this hour. It would be probably remiss of us to not discuss what guardianship is and kind of define what guardianship is, even though that's very complex. Um, but the reality is I think we do have to have a, a, an understanding of what guardianship is in relation to what this supported decision-making process is. We're going to talk about that very, very briefly, but nonetheless, we are going to address guardianship because we – hear it all the time when we travel around, uh, direct support professionals get confused and kind of misunderstand what guardianship actually is. And I think we'll be able to define that a little bit today. Um, offer some examples. Uh, we hope to offer some examples of, of the best practice in terms of this, to how to help people that we support with this, this, this supported this decision-making process, SDM. Um, and I can't wait to talk about this thing, quote unquote, the right to decide. I think it's going to be a sparked and spirited conversation that I think Desiree and Hezzy will uh, will facilitate. I'll facilitate that because I think there's a lot to that 
those four words, the right to decide, there's a lot to that. Um, so that said, that's what we're going to do today. Um, and I think before we get to uh, introducing uh, Desiree and Hezi, I, wanna, I just want to uh, give you the access and show you just some, some highlights from the Frontline Initiative. Um, this John? Is, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. Before you do that, can you pull up the PowerPoint so we can see it? It is not up? It is not up. Oh, thank you. Hold on one second. Main screen. How's that? That's much better. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. I'm so sorry. I didn't realize it wasn't. Ah, so now, so now you can see the ah. supporting choice issue volume 14. Yes, we can. Ah, wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> sorry, everybody. Um, so this is what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to introduce Desiree, that, that's who just spoke, uh, and Hezzy in just a moment. Uh, but I, I did want to just give you access to Frontline Initiative. If you look to the uh, right-hand side of your screen, there's a toolbox, if you will, for GoToWebinar, the GoToWebinar toolbox. And you'll be able to download this particular issue. I've uh, attached it as a PDF, which you're welcome to download and take and use. You can also find it um, online. Um, you can find it on our website. Um, but ultimately, th this is the issue that we are diving deeper into today. Um, <clears throat> issue volume 14, number... Uh, to, and it's from 2017, but that's okay. Um, I did want to just tell you a little bit about what's in it. Um, I think you're going to hear stories in this particular issue mm -hmm. around people that have benefited from supported decision-making, have benefited from not necessarily having a guardian in their life. Uh, you're going to hear stories about people that have siblings um, who, uh, who, who, who actually utilize the supported decision-making process that Desiree and Hezzy were going to be talking about today in making uh, a, a really rich life for a sibling. Um, Joe Macbeth gives a real great uh, update on what's going on at the NADSP, the National Alliance for Direct Support Professionals, in this issue, um, and many, many more things. But I, I really recommend that you, you take it, you, you download it, you look through it, um, and enjoy it and and have a conversation about it with your colleagues and with your and with your friends and with your family um so without further ado let's let's get to uh our presenters today um and they're going to introduce themselves um and once they finish introducing themselves i'm going to uh, facilitate a conversation with them about supported decision making so uh desiree and matt Matthew Hezzy, whatever your name is, um, if you could take just a couple moments and uh, introduce yourselves, I'd appreciate it. And then we're going to get to to business. All right, Hezzy, do you want me to go first? Yeah, you're left left hand side on the slide, so I'll give you that honor. All right, thank you. So good afternoon. My name is Desiree Lauxbear, and um, I have been working for the last five years as the Senior Director of Member Services for the New York Alliance for Inclusion and Innovation, which was formerly known as NYSACRA, for those of you who are New York State um, attendees. Uh, in the end of 2017, NYSACRA and NYSTRA combined to create our new organization, the New York Alliance for Inclusion and Innovation. Very exciting. Um, prior to working for NYSACRA, I worked in a provider working uh, supporting people in residential programs for over 20 years um, as a director for those programs. And previous to that, I was a direct support professional and started my career 30 years ago, uh, amazingly enough, at working as a DSP. So I've had a lot of opportunity to to experience what it is that the work is that direct support professionals do. I still keep a lot of connections with the people that I have supported previously, so it keeps me aware of what those issues are. And it's always a really great pleasure for me to work with DSPs and help provide information to them. Kezi, go ahead. Sure. Um, thanks for uh, giving me big shoes to fill. Tough act to follow. But, um, <laughs> My name is uh, Matthew Smith. I'm uh, uh, an attorney in uh, New York State, and I'm currently 
serving as senior project coordinator on Supported Decision Making New York, which is a five-year project that's funded by the uh, New York State Developmental Disabilities Planning Council that started in 2016. And um, we have the pleasure of, um, well, I sit at uh, Hunter College, which is part of the City University of New York. And um, we have the pleasure of working very closely with the New York Alliance, ARC of Westchester, and Disability Rights New York, which is the New York State Protection and Advocacy Agency um, on this project. And um, before that, in a prior life, um, I uh, worked a lot abroad and it's um, uh, on implementation of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, or um, often referred to as by its shorthand, the CRPD, um, which you'll hear about um, probably frequently throughout this conversation. Um, and uh, it's just, uh, I think, worth noting that um, a lot of the uh, same uh, challenges um, that uh, folks like myself and Desiree and many of you who are tuned in um, face when figuring out how to either assist or not um, people with disabilities to make their own decisions. Um, it's kind of, you know, goes across uh, cultural and socioeconomic um, uh, contexts. So it's definitely an issue that folks across the world are grappling with. And um, so whenever you come up with difficult, when you ever face difficult situations, it's sometimes nice to know that um, there are other folks in other parts of the world who are also um, coming up against the same uh, situations. Um, I'm also uh, last, but certainly not least, a sibling, an older brother of um, someone with um, developmental disability. And that has also kind of given me, uh, um, has informed a lot of um, how I approach uh, this sort of issue of, the right to decide and supported decision making. It's really um, been a touchstone of uh, my work professionally, um, as well as all the benefits, the personal benefits it, um, it has brought me. So um, I think I'm going to stop talking and uh, turn it over to John, and so we can get to the meat of the conversation. Great. Thank you, Matthew. But uh, um, people are going to hear Desiree calling you Hezzy and me calling you Hezzy. Just real briefly, that's your 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 nickname, your middle name, your real name. Just real briefly. Uh, what's, 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 Hezzy? what's Hezzy? It's a moniker. A nom de guerre, nom de plume. Um, <laughs> yeah, an alias more than anything else. Okay, Hezzy. So thank you, Hezzy. Here we go. Let's get into our conversation. Um, so... I think let's start with the, the basics. What is the definition of supported decision making? Um, I think direct support professionals hear a lot about informed decision making. Uh, supported decision making is not informed decision making. So if you could, uh, tell us what is, what is supported decision making. Hezzy, do you want me to take this? Um, yeah, I'll follow your lead. Um, all right, very good. Well, I'm just going to give the definition that I use um, that comes from Robert Dinnerstein. Uh, and he defines supported decision making as a series of relationships, practices, arrangements, and agreements of more or less formality and intensity designed to assist an individual with a disability to make and communicate to others decisions about their life. And what does that basically mean? It's, it's a formal way for a person with a disability to identify those people that they want to support them to be able to make and communicate decisions. That's great. And by the way, let me just interrupt there. Uh, 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 Robert Dinnerstein, he wrote uh, an article within this particular Frontline Initiative, uh, so, uh, and he talks exactly about that. So thank you, Desiree. That's a great definition. Hezzy, I'm sorry. Oh, no, nothing to be sorry about. Um, yes, uh, the def definition that Desiree gave, um, I, I support 100%. Um, Bob Dinnerstein is a, a leading uh, uh, thinker in this area, and um, I think he hits the nail on the head. Um, I would just also add that um, uh, it, it's sort of, in a way, um, very odd to define uh, supported decision making, and I would posit that um, the need to define what supported decision-making is and also what it is not um, arises from 
almost a default position that um, we've inherited over thousands of years of practice um, with regard to people with developmental disabilities and other types of disabilities as well um, that um, often results in um, the in subjecting them to either um, unnecessary or overly broad uh, forms of guardianship and so in a, in a strange way um, I believe at least that um, the the need to define something that um, I would assume most of the folks on this call have done in their daily lives um, uh, without really even thinking about um, arises from the sort of uh, the the palimpsest of service provision and um, of legal provisions that um, currently defines the the world of, that people with developmental disabilities uh, tend to live in. So basically, but for um, pervasive uh, assumptions about the capac mental capacity of people with developmental disabilities um, that often results in um, guardianship orders, uh, we wouldn't necessarily need or even think about needing a, um, a definition for something that um, you and I do every day. Um, so when Desiree um, quoting Professor Dinnerstein refers to sort of informal and formal arrangements. Um, we could all think about sort of formal and informal uh, arrangements that we use to get support. Um, some people use accountants to prepare their taxes, right? Um, just because you uh, formally engage someone to um, help you make financial decisions um, about how to represent your, your assets and your income. Um, doesn't mean you're incompetent to do so. Um, however, um, the reality that a lot of people with developmental disabilities unfortunately live in is whenever they need or seek support, right, even seeking it without necessarily needing it, um, uh, that's used as uh, an indicia of their uh, incompetence or inability to make those kinds of decisions when um, people without disabilities generally get the benefit of the doubt. Um, and uh, there's sort of a lot of different examples, and I'm sure um, folks uh, can think about sort of times when they've phoned a friend um, to, to, to uh, in a Regis Philbin manner, um, or have sought professional um, help uh, to make decisions with regard to healthcare, finances, um, uh, legal issues, uh, relationships. Um, something that's uh, a huge part of our lives. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, round out that definition with a little bit of context for why that definition, um, you know, exists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm going to just reinforce again, I mean, this is something that we all do. You know, we all have people in our lives and different people in our lives to help us with different decisions. Mm -hmm. I like to share, you know, that when I purchased a car, I don't like purchasing cars. It's not something I do well, but I went to my husband and son who are car fanatics and they helped me in getting the information I needed to be able to help to purchase the car that works for me. If I had a different decision to make, maybe regarding my health care, I'd go to my best, best friend who's a nurse who understands health care terminology better and could help support me that way. Whereas my, you know, my husband may not necessarily be the best person because he is not a healthcare professional. So we all use it every day. Hmm. And there are a lot of examples of how there are other people in our lives who use it in, in more formal ways, like through healthcare proxies and powers of attorney and, and those kinds of tools that are available, joint bank accounts all tools that help people in making decisions and support decisions that they make that we all utilize. Hmm. So it's interesting. I, 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 you know, we our our industry, if you will, or the, the world of supporting people with developmental disabilities in terms of, you know, through provider agencies and through, through, you know, support agencies, we love to formalize things, don't we? It's just that it seems to, we're, we're formalizing this informal process. <laughs> um, that, that doesn't mean it's not important, but it's so interesting uh, that 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 insight that you gave us, Hezzy. Um So that said, I think DSPs, direct support professionals, are always asking about guardianship, and and when somebody has a guardian or conservator or whatever the terminology is. Um, 
I think there's a lot of confusion, a lot of a misunderstanding about what a guardian is, but also in context with this supported decision-making process, could you guys speak to, could you talk about what is supported decision-making versus guardianship or what are, you know, what, what are the definitions of each of those? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, should I take a first stab, Desiree? Since, uh, Go for it, Hezzy. This is uh, guardianship. So I, I think it's helpful to understand guardianship, um, just two things about it, um, or conservatorship. Um, uh, one, it involves the, um, the transfer of decision-making uh, authority um, from one person to another. And two, um, that transfer is often premised on the uh, perceived incapacity of uh, a person um, with a developmental disability or with another diagnosis of um, uh, to make those decisions that are the, the authority for which is being transferred to another party. Um, the uh, guardianships and conservatorships can be plenary, full, or um, they can be uh, partial. Um, and the practice in and around, not only the legal standards for determining incapacity and uh, determining what rights uh, are, or what um, decision-making areas are uh, restricted, um, uh, those legal standards differ, but also the practice, how, those, how rigorously or uh, relaxedly those um, standards are applied varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, which means from state to state. And um, for those tuning in from uh, outside the US, from province to province or country to country. Um, it, but those sort of two things um, generally tend to remain the same, um, uh, notwithstanding the differences in practice and in the, the, the specifics of the, the standard. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, supported decision making, or at least as I posited, um, sort of the need to define it, or you know, as John uh, uh, mentioned, um, to formalize it um, in a way, um, kind of comes from this uh, this the prevalence of guardianship, um, and so supported decision making um, con is uh, can be contrasted with guardianship because um, where guardianship entails removing the decision-making authority for one or more areas of decision-making um, from one person to another, supported decision-making does not. Um, supported decision-making does not, as it's generally understood, um, result in a restriction uh, on uh, a person with developmental disabilities um, right uh, decision decision-making um, authority. Um, so that's sort of the the big difference. Now um, to the point of, you know, the extent to which supported decision making is formalized or not, um, some places um, recognize certain types of agreements called supported decision making agreements. In the United States, Texas and Delaware currently recognize supported decision making agreements. And those serve uh, to basically formalize and give legal recognition to people uh, with developmental disabilities who make decisions with the support of others, but who nevertheless have the authority, the legal authority to make those decisions, even though they're um, uh, using supports from other people to do so. Um, but uh, one doesn't need um, a state statute recognizing a form in order to uh, engage in supported decision making. Um, it can be something informal. Um, it can be often DSPs provide um, crucial supports to people with developmental disabilities. They provide information or they help people with developmental disabilities understand their options to weigh the consequences of possible decisions, identify possible alternatives to a choice that they're presented. Um, and that doesn't require a, a form. Um, there are some uses to having forms. Um, there are some downsides to having forms. Um, but um, that's sort of uh, how supported decision making, I would say, differs from guardianship in the main. Although I'm sure, Desiree, you can uh, flesh out a little bit more of that sort of broad distinction that I outlined. Well, I, yeah, I guess in, in, it's some things to consider regarding um, supported decision making. The way we're approaching it here in, in New York 
if we're not looking at supported decision making being um, better than guardianship, we're looking at it as being an alternative to guardianship. One of the things that we're discovering is that people with disabilities and their families, when they get to be of, of the age where they're transitioning to adulthood, families want to be able to be protective of people that they love and support, and they're not sure how to do that. And guardianship has traditionally been the only alternative to doing that. And we're, we're introducing supported decision making as another way to be able to support a person with a disability to have the ability to make decisions and um, still have those supports in place in a legal kind of way, not where somebody is making those decisions for them, as, as has he said, you know, not as a um, as a person who's who's a substitute decision maker, but to be able to support them in learning how to make their own decisions going forward um, as a, a mechanism of being able to to express their own decisions and preferences and choice, but also as a recognition of a way to be able to help them support their own safety. We can talk about that a little bit more. So we're, we look at supported decision making as a tool, as an, an alternative um, that can be used for people with disabilities instead of something like guardianship, which can take away, in some cases, all, all civil rights of a person, depending on where you are and what type of guardianship is employed. Um, and as a mechanism that, that helps people be more self-determining and growing. Thank you. That, you know, that, that, that really, there's a lot of clarification in, in what you, you both just gave us. So thank you. Um, got another, uh, I think this is, this is, I think what we really want to know, uh, what, what are the benefits to this process of supported decision-making, uh, for people that obviously receive support, but also for, for families and, and just for anybody, uh, what what are the benefits to supported the, the process of supported decision making? Well, I'll start with this, Hezzy, and you can fill in from there. Huh? One of the reasons that you know we we feel so strongly about supported decision making as being an alternative is because there's research out there that shows that people who are not enabled to make their own decisions tend to be more at risk for abuse and 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 having rights violations. And it would sound like, you know, guardianship is supposed to protect that, but research shows that it doesn't. When a, when a person loses their, their ability to make decisions and their civil rights, they lose some important rights such as the ability to contract or to choose where they're going to work or even to marry. You know, you think about people that you might support who have guardians, who might even live on their own in a lot of ways and maybe get supports in an apartment program or whatever, and they can't go down the street to their local gym and sign a contract for a gym membership legally because they don't have the legal right to do that. So it helps promote a person's independence to be able to, to have that um, ability to make their own decisions. It also allows people to take risks. You know, we all know of that guardian who might be overreaching and, and won't allow any decisions to be made that are reflective of that person. And, and we all learn from, from taking risks and having bad choices. So if you're never allowed to make a bad choice, how can you expect to be able to, to learn to make good choices? Um, back to the exploitation piece, supported decision-making helps to solidify some relationships with people so that people are are supported by maybe a circle of support of their choosing. Um, and that maybe not in the necessarily sense that, that we tend to use it in the field, but, but definitely it's that same idea of having that group of supporters that that individual has chosen to help them in, in getting information they need and to be able to communicate the decisions that they're making. Um, and of course, then it allows them to express their own human rights. Izzy, what am I missing? Oh man, uh, making, stuff, it hard, I know. making it hard for me. Um, I think uh, uh, just the, the basic benefit, um, and it's so basic that I think that's why um, uh, Desiree, you know, it's not that you skipped over it, but because I think you, you highlighted a lot of the, the really important benefits that come to mind, but um, just the, the maintaining the legal authority to make certain yeah. decisions. Um, 
because uh, one thing that, um, I mean, often, and this is not, you know, um, representative of all cases, but often with regard to people with developmental disabilities, um, parents or caregivers or family members seek guardianship around the time that that person attains the age of legal majority, so around the age of 18. And um, at that time, uh, if I were to have been adjudicated um, with regard to my decision-making capacity at the ripe old age of 18, I don't know how well I would have fared. Um, but uh, because I don't have a developmental disability, uh, I was, um, as a, um, uh, a poor 18-year-old decision maker, given the benefit of the doubt that I would one day um, acquire uh, better decision-making um, abilities. And um, when, uh, so the, the time when guardianship is sought is, um, in a lot of ways, unfortunate because as we grow older, we generally become better decision makers. And once, however, the legal authority to make decisions transfers from a person with developmental disabilities to a guardian, there are fewer incentives for the guardian to um, really invest in uh, developing a person with developmental disabilities, decision-making abilities. Um, because it's often easier for a guardian to sign off on something rather than spend the time that might be necessary to help a person with developmental disabilities to understand the available options and alternatives and um, make his or her own decision. I know from my own personal experience with uh, regard to my sister that um, it's, uh, it's often a lot easier to do things for her rather than to um, have her understand what needs to be done and make a decision that um, can uh, move the ball forward um, with regard to anything regarding housing, with regard to administering her, her benefits, with regard even just to go where to, what to go do on the weekends um, and how to spend her time. So um, uh, what happens is that by transferring that legal authority um, at an early age, um, people sort of don't have the full range of experiences that help us all hone our abilities to make uh, decisions that we're, uh, we're happy with. Um, and then sort of an, the, the other sort of um, negative to the timing of many guardianship applications is um, that at the time that many parents or family members seek guardianship, they're, they're sort of thinking about sort of short-term things that they need to address. So um, making sure that uh, someone uh, may receives benefits or um, continues to get um, uh, health services or even educational decisions. Often schools um, will uh, recommend that uh, parents seek guardianship over their children. Um, and not, they don't really necessarily think of, well, even if the parent, him or herself, is completely comfortable with having plenary decision-making authority over his or her child, would they be comfortable giving that plenary authority in cases where it is plenary to someone else who doesn't have the same love and care and knowledge of that person with disability as the parent. Um, because when the parent seeks guardianship, when the development, the person with development disability is at age 18, um, they're not often thinking about whether that person with development disability will survive them. And then if that person with the disability survives the parent, whom they would be comfortable giving that sort of total decision-making authority to the person with, um, uh, over the person with developmental disability. So when the guardianship, in other words, passes from the parent to someone else, who do they want to be able to make a broad range of, a possibly broad range of decisions over that uh, person with disabilities life? And so that ties into the, the questions of vulnerability and exploitation that Desiree, um, that Desiree mentioned earlier, but it's a very sort of concrete question and a lot of times parents who are uh, counseled 
by service providers or by educators or by healthcare professionals or even by attorneys to seek guardianship, um, they're uh, not questioned about whether they would feel comfortable were someone else to have the same kind of authority <coughs> for themselves um, uh, later on. Because the reality is that in most jurisdictions, once you're under guardianship um, or subject to a guardianship order, it's very hard to undo that. Um, and they're not asked that kind of core question. So that it's sort of definitional in support of decision making that one retains legal authority to make decisions. Um, and that's why I think uh, we're, uh, I'm just adding on, but I think it's really important for those sort of two reasons with regard to the timing and also the question of the, uh, the guardianship, uh, successor guardians. So yeah. I would just add that. Yeah, yeah that's, you know, I think you bring about a, a huge, I, I think all of us sometimes, I think it's understood, but we, we don't necessarily think about it, the, the impact that it has to put somebody into that, into, into guardianship uh, as a parent, you know, and that it's ultimately about wanting to protect their loved one and make sure that their loved one isn't exploited or harmed or will be cared for when they're gone, you know, um, and I think that's, that's so important, but that's, that's a whole other webinar, um, a whole other issue of frontline <laughs> initiative, right? But um, I, I, you, you, you both mentioned risk, you know, and I think this next question can go into something that I think direct support professionals are concerned with so much in terms of the risk that people might experience that they support. Um, and so and maybe that can connect to this uh, next question or dialogue point. What are some of the challenges that go on in the supported decision-making process? Um, and if you could have some time to talk about when there is, in fact, risk involved in a decision that is being made in this SDM process. You want to go first, Tezzy? Happy to. Um, so the the risks involved right are is that someone makes a quote unquote bad decision and that someone uh out of, due to negligence or lack of concern right is going to be on the hook for the consequences the negative outcomes of that quote unquote sort of bad decision um liability in other words and i'm sure that um, many of the direct service professionals who are on the call have heard that term um, thrown around a lot. And um, most, um, most jurisdictions um, don't have, uh, are, are conservative with regard to um, how liability is allocated. So um, agencies that provide services to people with developmental disabilities often err on the side of caution with regard to allowing a person with developmental disabilities to make his or her own decisions. And that often results in sort of, you know, restrictive policies with regard to whether a person can make certain decisions um, in order to avoid liability. Um, so i.e. a lawsuit from the person with disability him or herself or family members um, saying that the uh, alleging that the service provider did not do its due diligence in um, uh, protecting and providing for um, the, the person with development disability. So um, one, uh, I think, emerging and interesting issue in this regard that provides a useful sort of flashpoint um, are issues with regard to um, uh, evaluations of consent to um, for sexual activity. Um, lots of uh, service provider organizations employ them, regardless of whether someone has been formally adjudicated to be able to provide consent to sexual act activity or not. Um, and it's a, it's a practice that raises lots of legal and uh, interesting legal and ethical dimensions. Um, and uh, there are, of course, with regard to, you know, sexual activity, um, risks um, involved. And there's also uh, um, benefits involved. And often, um, uh, at least in my experience, I've seen service provider agencies err on the side of minimizing risks, but
but at the same time, uh, minimizing the person with development disabilities um, ability to access the uh, concomitant benefits of um, that sexual activity. Um, if uh, I had someone looking over my shoulder and evaluating um, my, uh, my choices with regard to um, my personal life, um, I may have been uh, saved from some um, uh, some of the risks that uh, are inherent to those activities, but I would have missed out on a lot of um, those benefits as well. And um, the the challenge, right, is kind of striking the right balance, not only at the practitioner level, right, at the one-to-one -one level of a develop, uh, direct support professional um, with an individual, but also um, on a systems level so that um, lie so that agencies um, are able to work in an environment where they don't always have to look over their shoulder and fear um, uh, lawsuits, expensive possible lawsuits, um, when um, a concerned family member or parent or even the person with development disability itself tries to hold the, uh, the organization liable for um, a failure to protect the person from the negative consequences of what might have been a very informed um, decision at the end of the day. So um, that balance, right, balancing the, uh, the so-called dignity of risk, allowing persons with developmental disabilities the same opportunities to make bad decisions, um, while also uh, holding both service providers and other third parties responsible for um, the failure to provide necessary and or requested supports to make those decisions is um, an interesting uh, topic. And it will require, um, sort of as supportive decision-making requires, um, less of a, an outcomes-oriented uh, outlook and more of a process-oriented outlook. So instead of um, uh, looking at whether someone um, it experienced a negative outcome because of a decision, uh, instead looking at whether the person received the supports that he or she requested and or needed um, in order to uh, actually make that decision, regardless of whether the outcomes were perceived to be negative or positive. Um, and one of the interesting things before I uh, stop myself from droning on relentlessly um, is that, um, at least in my experience, and I don't know about how many others, but um, some uh, decisions that I've made that initially seem to have negative consequences um, several years down the line appear to uh, be positive. Um, uh, and so what might be negative in the short term also in a longer, with a longer view, might come to yield some positive benefits. So that's just something that uh, I think um, this, this sort of is at the heart of the challenges with regard to supported decision making is sort of recalibrating how we, uh, um, how much, uh, how we allocate liability and how we allocate risk, um, both on an individual level and on a systems level. Hezzy, I have absolutely nothing to add to that. I mean, I think you really covered it really well. So it is, in, and as, from a DSP perspective, you know, risk is a huge concern. If you are working with somebody who's making their own decisions and you know you know that someone might perceive it as risk, your responsibility, of course, is first to that person, but being able to demonstrate and document that you have shared with them information that they need to make a well-informed decision and that includes the consequences and just making sure that you have documented that well because if you can show that you've done your piece from a legal perspective, you probably are going to be okay. Yeah, well, thank you both. That was, you know, man, we could have a webinar just on that topic. Um, <laughs> hey, uh, this is important, and I know we, I, we could go on and on about this, but I'd like both of your, uh, your, your perspectives on this. People have a quote-unquote right, and I say right, a legal right, and I think a philosophical right, quote-unquote, to make their own decisions. Go. Yes. All Next right. You want, you go ahead, Hesse, if you want. 
Oh no, yes, next slide. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's here's my here's my piece. You know, I I believe that people do have the right to make their own decisions. And you know what? Decisions come on all levels. There are simple decisions, what I'm going to eat for breakfast, you know, to things that are much more complicated. Where am I going to live? Who am I going to spend the rest of my life with? I think that decision making, there's a continuum of decision making and not everybody just knows how to make decisions. So, but everybody does have preferences and wills. If you're working with somebody who has some very complex needs, maybe you doesn't use a formal communication um, technique, you know, you're still going to know whether they like the vegetable that you've put on their plate and you're assisting them in eating, or if they don't, they're making a decision and they're expressing that decision. You know, if, if you are working with somebody who has an interest in, in something that's maybe much more risky, it's a matter of being able to help provide that person the information so that they can make an informed decision. And all of those goes, and we can talk about that a little bit more, but all of that goes towards the ability to make a supported decision. So from a legal perspective. So my feeling is yes, everybody has a right to make their own decisions and every person has a will and a preference. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And I was being a little curt and um, uh, 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 fun, uh, funny with um, the uh, my earlier response, but um, the, I think the question itself is interestingly uh, loaded um, insofar as I think one of the interesting things that the concept, at least the, or at least the practice of support decision making around the world today um, brings to bear is this sort of challenge of viewing the individual as an atomistic uh, entity. So uh, an individual in who makes decisions or who goes about his or her um, life in a vacuum. Um, and so what does it mean for a decision to be my own? Um, does uh, a decision, is a decision my own when I have thoroughly understood and digested a large quantity of information? Or if I implement the, uh, the advice I receive from another individual, um, does that make a decision less my own? Right, even if I'm just parroting what I've heard um, somewhere else, and so it kind of, really on a deep level, kind of challenges these these paradigms about you know what is my decision, what is not, um, and whether I'm able to make decisions and whether I'm not. And as Desiree said, decisions can be small and they can be big. They start um, uh, as Eleanor Roosevelt said about um, human rights at the time that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was being um, adopted by the United Nations that uh, human rights start in the home and um, whether someone uh, or how allowing someone to um, make decisions about um, simple things what to wear what to eat what to do in their free time um, can uh, can uh, really um, is a reflection of the exercise of the sort of the right to make decisions. And when we talk about a right to make decisions, um, in, um, in, in our line of work, we often refer to the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the CRPD, which in Article 12 talks about the right of people with um, disabilities to make decisions, not only make decisions, but also to receive the support they may need in order to make those decisions. And um, uh, that's an important place. And we've signaled it earlier that dis, uh, the DSPs have a big role to play in providing support to people with disabilities to make decisions. Um, but that's sort of part and parcel of um, the, the right to make decisions. It's not just a right to decide, but it's a right to receive the support that they may want or need um, in order to make decisions big and small. Thank you. Thank you both. That's really, I, that's exactly what I wanted to have kind of out there as a response to that question. So wonderful. Um, What's the role of direct support professionals in this whole process? Because I think there's many different uh, there's many different players within the supported decision making uh, uh, circle uh, process. Uh, what's the direct support professional's role 
uh, in this process. I'll take this. Um, the direct support professional's role is to be able to help people practice decision making. You know, as we've kind of just said, it's, decision making isn't something that people just naturally do, especially if you're a person who's never had the opportunity to to really make decisions that people have always made them for your, for themselves or for, 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 for you. So with that being said, as a direct support professional, it is your responsibility to give people the opportunity to make decisions and every opportunity they have to practice that skill, you know, and respect the decisions that are made. I know in some cases you might work with somebody who has a guardian or a parent who's, who, um, may not want to allow someone to make those decisions, but then your role is to be able to help that person um, communicate their interest in the decisions they want to make. So I would just say, you're the, as a direct support professional, you're the person who's going to be probably the most influential in helping someone practice decision making, and I provide every opportunity possible from you know what time a person decides to get up in the morning or go to bed in the evening to what they're going to wear to how they're spending their weekends to who they're spending their time with helping provide information and access to information in a way that um, the person you support can best receive it so that they can make informed decisions and you know informed decision making is the basis of supported decision making because when a person now has the skills to be able to start making you know, basic decisions, it'll give them the confidence um, and the empowerment to maybe make some of those bigger decisions that goes towards um, having a, a, a supported decision-making ability. Well, yeah, and I would want to just, you know, uh, second Desiree's response by um, sort of stating that uh, in our project, the Supported Decision Making New York project, where um, we're working with over 20 uh, folks with developmental disabilities currently to make uh, so-called supported decision making agreements, um, that um, DSPs have uh, are forming part um, of a number of uh, people's uh, support um, teams, and that in at least one case, um, DSPs were um, indispensable in actually getting, uh, helping the person to sign up for the process when uh, initially his um, guardians were skeptical of the uh, benefits of him um, uh, working towards signing and executing a supported decision-making agreement. So um, DSPs, uh, uh, just in our, uh, the small experience of our, um, our New York uh, State project um, is, is, is huge, potentially huge. Um, and uh, that said, um, there's also a tricky, um, as, and as Desiree um, alluded to, there's also a tricky sort of responsibility to um, work within the legal, the strictures of the legal regime in which you find yourself. And so um, it, it might pose tensions, and certainly does pose tensions often when um, working with uh, folks who are under guardianship because um, the, the law in that jurisdiction will recognize that uh, a third party, i.e. the guardian, has decision-making authority, legal decision-making authority in certain areas. Um, and so while an individual with developmental disability might have um, uh, as a human right, this right to decide, um, as a practical matter, um, that will come up against um, domestic uh, state uh, state laws that might authorize restrictions of that right um, for the time being. And so navigating those those conflicts is is tough, um, mm -hmm. but uh, DPs again have a huge role in helping people with development disabilities actually uh, exercise their human right um, to uh, make decisions. No, yeah. no, thanks guys, that's, that's a great, that's a great response to that uh, that question. Um, uh, and as I knew this is going to go so fast, we only have a few minutes left. Um, and so, please, if you could, get out your crystal balls, and uh, your 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 cards, your tea leaves, whatever it is. <laughs> what do you believe is going to happen in the next few years, uh, as we see? And you even alluded to it, uh, Hezi, that you know this project 
that's happening in New York with supported decision making is going to really it's going to have tremendous impact. What what do you think is going to happen? Uh, is is supported decision making going to become more accepted? Do you think guardianship is going to be less of an option? Uh, just just speak on that if you could. Just and we only have about five minutes. Six minutes left. I'd love your pers- both of your perspectives on that. Your 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 future thoughts on supported decision making. You want me to go first? Uh, sure. All right. This is my feeling. I do think that you're going to see more and more um, supported decision making happening around the country and around the world. We've got all kinds of things that are pointing in that direction. Um, from a policy standpoint, from the UN Convention um, for People um, with Disabilities to to CMS the, um, and the Home and Community Rule and Olmstead laws and all of those things that point towards people being more self-determining and getting the supports that they need to be able to function as independent people in our interdependent people in their communities. So I think we're going to see more and more of this. I think young families and young self-advocates are excited about the opportunities to be able to help empower um, themselves and the people that they love. So we're going to, I just think it's been going to be one of those things that we're going to see a, um, more action in that direction. Go ahead, Izzy. Yeah, and I think that's right. You'll be uh, you'll be seeing more and more supported decision making, but um, sort of a corollary challenge um, that I th- in a debate that I think we'll um, uh, we'll see and that you will see um, in the five, ten, twenty years uh, ahead um, is that as supported decision making um, gains uh, wider acceptance, um, that uh, what supported decision making should look like in practice will be, um, I think, hotly contested. And so, um, a number of self advocates that um, we uh, work with through this project, you know, have throughout the project expressed concerns that supported decision making not be reduced to another sort of goal on their individualized service plan. Mm. That mm-hmm. it not just become. Uh, a box to check off. Mm. And so that uh, definitely bumps up against the uh, sort of the, this, the formalization of recognition of supported decision making, how to also sort of build into that recognition, um, the flexibility that a lot of folks with development disabilities want and uh, deserve um, as they uh, exercise their right to decide. So I think that's something that will be really interesting to look forward to. And um, uh, it, it's, you know, the, 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 the positive spin on that is that, um, you know, no one's, is job security. Uh, no one's going to be, um, uh, uh, no one who works on supported decision making will be out of a job anytime soon. There will be new issues that arise. So, uh, <laughs> to look forward to. Thank you for that prognostication. That's great. Oh, my goodness. Um, well, you know what? I'm sad to say um, this went rapidly, at least for me. Um, our time, unfortunately, is over. Um, but I have a feeling we might have to revisit this topic. Um, but until we do that, I, I just, you know, this, this, is, this has been really f- lots of insight, uh, I think, for the listeners, certainly for me. Um, and just to thank you, uh, both Desiree and Matt, Matthew, um, has he whatever your name is, dude, um, <laughs> um, for what you do, A, in terms of just helping people with disabilities and helping family members with this supported decision-making uh, process and this labyrinth that you've just described. Um, so thank you for doing that. But, and also thank you for, for contributing to Frontline Initiative um, uh, and certainly to this webinar um, this is going to be archived, and I think I'm going to go back to it. I'm going to advise people to go back to listen to it because I think what you gave us today is a real great framework for what supported decision making is and how important it is in the lives of people with disabilities um, and how it can really, I think, create uh, uh, wonderful outcomes for people um, if, if it's done properly. Um, so for that, both of you, thank you. Um, we appreciate all you do. Um, and just keep in mind, uh, the next issue of Frontline Initiative will be out uh, before you know it. It's going to be, I believe, on 
the emerging roles and the developing roles of direct support professionals, kind of uh, what is the role of direct support professionals uh, now uh, in, in, in the world of people with disabilities um, and, and how it's changed. Look, look forward to that um, with a, uh, obviously a, a companion webinar to, to dive deeper as we did today. Um, we have a conference, the National Alliance for Direct Support Professionals, fourth one is coming up uh, September 7th and 8th, 2018 in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, we certainly invite you to, to think about coming to that and come to that. Um, we've got some great speakers lined up, some great uh, workshops. Um, look to our website, www.nadsp.org, uh, for information about that. Um, again, keep in mind that this webinar, among many other webinars, are available on our website. Um, if you're a member uh, of the NADSP, uh, look, look for a rebroadcast of this uh, webinar uh, sooner than later. Um, and keep looking to uh, our, our website for any new, uh, any new information coming your way uh, about direct support professionals in North America. Uh, thank you all very much for attending this, and we'll see you down the road.